When you talk about the legends of Brazilian football, Pelé, uh, Garrincha, Zico, uh, Roberto Rivelino, uh, obviously Ronaldo, Romario, Bebeto, you talk about the achievements, you talk about the numbers, you talk about the the accolades that they received throughout their careers and, and the gaudy statistics that they were able to, to, to gather. But if you end up looking at the most respected man ever in Brazilian football, uh, you'd have to put Mario Lobo Zagallo in that list, maybe even at the very top of that list. Zagallo, of course, four, four World Cups. Two as a player, two as a coach. Or one as an assistant coach, I guess. Depends if you want to get into the whole semantics of it all. Zagallo was someone that offered that calm um, within the storm. There were a lot of storms that, were, that have always surrounded Brazilian football. Let's be honest. And if there was something that he did was he either was the lightning rod... Or he found a way to calm things down internally. Of course, 1958 and 62, he was the one that was the, the leader, if you will. Obviously, Pele in 58, Garrincha in 62, were the ones that gathered all or garnered all the the uh, the attention. But as a player, he really wasn't this this overwhelming force although his personality and his willingness to do things that weren't going to garner him all the headlines made him almost indispensable as a player as a forward he wasn't this goal scoring machine but he did the dirty work he, he was willing to go and drop back and defend he was willing to do the practical and the economical in order for Brazil to be able to function properly and be that balance both on the pitch and even to a metaphorical standpoint he ends up being that balance in 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 Brazil for nearly four decades it's interesting to hear all of the things that have come up about Mario Lobo Zagallo and the respect that people have over a person that was very very uh, well centered now when you talk about his political leanings, that's a different story. But when you talk about what he was able to do within the dressing room, what he was able to do as that calming figure, as as that figurehead, and, and I think I'm, I'm being cruel by saying he was a figurehead because he, he was he was more than that. He he was a leader that gave a very calming. Hey, I'll do I'll do what I have to do. Don't worry, I'll take care of this. I'll cover this. You guys be you. Interesting to say that, right? Interesting to hear that because in 1970, he was able to, or not, not 1970, 58 and 62, he was the one that dropped back and, and helped Brazil achieve that balance with a very ultra offensive attack with, a, with players that were more involved <laughs> looking forward than looking back. And, and Zagallo was the one that did that. He didn't want his, his teams to suffer those types of con so in 1970 or actually I should go a little bit further back 1968-69 when Joao Saldana was still the coach of Brazil Brazil was going through a lot of issues and, and and this is where I guess the respect factor begins to emerge for Zagallo the figure no longer Zagallo the player as a manager I mean mind you he, he's 39 almost 40 years of age at this stage of his life and Zagallo goes and, 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 and well, Joao Saldana was also not only from a political standpoint causing a lot of problems and a lot of complications in a Brazil that at that point was in the middle of a military dictatorship, it was very hard for, first of all, for the military dictatorship to go and say, you know, this man's leading us to the World Cup in Mexico, yet his ideals and his political leanings were completely the opposite of the dictatorship itself. So, 
that caused a lot of inconveniences. It caused a lot of friction. Uh, Zagallo was the complete opposite politically of Joao Saldana. Let's, let's start there as well, just so you have an idea where I'm heading with this. Saldana ends up being relieved because not only that, he was also having philosophical football, philosophical issues as well with certain players. And Brazil wasn't this, this um, you know, what it seems because all we see are the highlights of the 1970 World Cup and they just absolutely steamrolled over everyone. You make it seem or it seems or it, it appears or people conceive or preconceive that the fact that it was a bed of roses for Brazil leading into that World Cup and it wasn't. I mean, there was there were doubts that Pele was even going to play that World Cup, and, and, and to a, to a certain extent, I mean, he prepared like no one could have ever prepared before for a tournament. But there are still certain things about him wanting to represent, and, and and of course, he was being tossed around as this national figure. Also, remember the fact that you know he was he could have gone to Real Madrid, but then of course the law established that Pelé is basically a national entity so he could not play outside of Brazil until after he retired. Of course, ends up being the case after he retires from Santos, ends up going to the New York Cosmos. So, that 1970 World Cup, Saldana leaves, Zagallo arrives. Zagallo, like I said, a more right-leaning uh, individual now, it does, is it right or is it wrong? No, it, it has nothing to do whether it's right or wrong. It's just the circumstances of the moment in 1969 in Brazil. And he takes over and ends up being more of the calming figure and does a couple of things to be able to understand what he's heading into. Mind you, for those of you that aren't familiar with Mexico in 1970, even 1986... I mean, you can hear Gary Lineker, you can hear many players that played in the 1986 World Cup talking about the, the kickoff times in Mexico, especially in Mexico City. And, and for Brazil, there was one realization that Zangalo knew that they had to play a more compact, a more economic, a more practical way. Now, practical within the pieces that he had available on, on the pitch. And... Uh, Clovaldo ends up dropping back. Rivelino ends up being, of course, Clovaldo uh, on the left. And, and, and you have Rivelino dropping back to be a more defensive. I want to, be a little, 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 want to make that clear. Rivelino playing. But he ended up uh, being a more or more defensive than he usually was. Let's leave it at that. But it was in an effort to offer balance, to offer more of a compact formation. And if there was something that that Brazil team had, it was spacing. If you look at the highlights, the spacing that this Brazilian team had, it was pretty well distributed and it was very consistent throughout. Everybody move up, everybody drop back. That's not something that Spain invented. <laughs> many, many, they, oh, you know, because Brazil moved in that manner. And that's something that was attributable to Mario Lobo Zagallo. Zagallo, of course has has that um, capability of settling things down when it comes to uh, when it comes to this Brazilian side of 1970 and of course I don't need to redact everything that happened in that World Cup we know exactly what happened and we know why that team ends up being one of the greatest teams of all time that's where Zagallo gets a great deal of respect and of course, he had a great relationship with Pelé. Keep in mind, Pelé was the big well, rival. Keep in mind, the Santos over in Sao Paulo with Pelé, with Pepe. You know, and then you had Botafogo with, of course, um, uh, with Zagallo, with uh, Nilton Santos, and, and many others. Of course, you, those were the two powerhouse teams in the 1960s, especially Santos, that end up being, of course, you did have, Flum, obviously you had Fluminense, you had Flamengo, uh, you had Palmeiras as well. Palmeiras was also a powerhouse in the 1960s as well, getting to Copa Lib finals, as they still do today. So, that ends up being one of the, oh, oh you know who I forgot? For Botafogo, Gahincha. Yeah, 
just a little just a little omission there in terms of of, of that um, Botafogo side on the 1960s uh, but I digress so you look at him as a figure there of course 24 years later after a lot of failures after a lot of controversy after a lot of issues of course Zagallo returns but this time he's the assistant to Carlos Alberto Pajera keep in mind again it's not a bed of roses for Brazil in 1994 because Brazil had to wait until basically the very last round to find out whether they're going to qualify or not. So always keep in mind that whenever Brazil has a hard time in World Cup qualifiers, or recently, you can go back even to 1994, when they've had trouble qualifying for a World Cup, they end up usually winning it. 2002 is another example. Uh, Zagallo ends up being part of Carlos Alberto Pareda's um, coaching staff. And you have another controversy there. And how do you balance it out? Of course, it's the whole Bebeto Romario situation that's going on. And mind you, this Brazil side ends up winning the World Cup, but ends up being one of the more, I think I've heard words that describe this team, insipid, uh, anti-Brazilian all these types of, of terms, derogatory terms, I may add, that, that they end up referring to the 1994 side as. But then, of course, many forget that Romario and Bebeto ended up uh, being the big stars for them in that World Cup. And not only that, there was this rivalry going back years between both of them. And, and that ends up being, that World Cup ends up being the bonding moment for both Bebeto and Romario. In, in, the, in terms of, of, of what they were able to do and what they had done throughout their respective careers. And Zagallo had something to do with that, knowing, hey, you know what? The best thing we can do is to once again get these two players together and, and find out how they can end up being a force to be reckoned with, which they were back in the 1989 Copa America. They couldn't make it to the 1990 World Cup because of injuries, both of them, we could keep in mind. But when Zagallo's there, he he's one of the people that pushed for both of these players to play together. Pajeda leaves, Zagallo takes over in 1998, and he offers serenity. I mean, at that time, Brazil was just all over the place. I can tell you because Brazil, at that time, the, the reigning champion in the World Cup did not have to qualify. They automatically qualified for the next World Cup. So then the next four years was just basically a Brazil World Tour, which ended up being one of the more amazing experiences that you can have because there was one match, and I remember in 1997, where Brazil played Mexico. And uh, Brazil just slaughtered Mexico, 4-0. And then after that, uh, Romario, or, or there were a couple of players that went on stage because after the game, it was here in, in South Florida, uh, Brazil played Mexico, and um, they had a stage set for Carlos Santana post-game. I was over with my father, and uh, it was a good time. I can tell you that. Uh, saw a lot of things about my father in that particular moment that I had never seen in my life. He started getting some flashbacks. But then again, that's for another conversation for another time. <laughs> uh, so that Brazilian side comes into the World Cup in 1998. Everything's kind of clicking a little bit better compared to 94. But then all of a sudden, Ronaldo ends up getting injured, and or not injured, I don't know, no one knows to this day exactly what happened in that 1998 final, and what happened to Ronaldo in that final. And uh, then Zagallo ends up leaving. But at that point, Zagallo's legacy was already cemented and respected. And, and to, even to today, there's been a great deal of appreciation for Mario Lobo Zagallo in Brazilian football because of what he's been able to do the centering, you know, he, he was that grounding force and he was very practical, very pragmatic, very understanding what, what he needed to do in the team and it was always, always trying to calm things down and it was always trying to, to keep things... Oh, by the way, what I forgot about that 1998 World Cup was the whole Romario issue. Keep in mind, Ronaldo ends up stepping in. He was on the team in 94, he doesn't play a single game, but Ronaldo was 17 in that World Cup. Uh, okay, so Romario had come back. Romario had come back from Barcelona, goes to Flamengo, has some problems at Flamengo, goes to Vasco da Gama. 
Keep in mind, this is a team with Vasco da Gama with both Romario and Edmundo. <laughs> an amazing team. An amazing team that, that, that Vasco da Gama side ends up being. They end up winning the Copa Libertadores. And uh, Romario ends up having a lot of trouble with the Brazilian FA. So much so that there ends up being, you know, it ends up, if there is one negative side to Zagallo, it ends up being that. But then again, it's hard to to manage a, a player such as Romario. You can ask, well, you could have asked Johan Cruyff. You could have asked many others. And, and he was a player that was just unique. And at this point, the Brazilian FA was basically saying, no, Romario has a knock and Romario has a knock and Romario has a knock and he won't be able to go to the World Cup. So, Ronaldo ends up stepping in. Of course, ah, he didn't do too bad in that World Cup. And of course, in subsequent World Cups, uh, did Ronaldo. But um, in terms of, of problems, there were problems and he was able to manage them well. He managed the dressing room well. He garnered respect because of his trajectory, because of, of him understanding the footballer because of him understanding how, how things were supposed to be and they had to be his way. Uh, was it? Yeah, it was in 98. One of his former players, Tostao, Tostao, was a pundit on Brazilian television and he was criticizing, uh, he was criticizing Zagallo as ultrapassado, as, as, as old-fashioned, as, as out of touch if you will. And uh, in terms of his, of his training methods, he, he, he basically said, I want to remember, I, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but just so you get the idea, he goes and says, well, Zagallo's using the same uh, methods of training that he was using in 1970 in 1998. So that ends up being an issue, or at least some would say it ends up being an issue. It really didn't. There were just a lot of external factors that Zagallo had to deal with, and of course, then he ends up leaving. So, Zagallo, like I said, the legacy that he that he left was amazing. The respect, consensus respect that Mario Lobo Zagallo has within Brazilian football is unmatched in terms of what he's, he was able to do. And even to this day, of course, many in Brazil lamenting his passing at 92 just what was it less than 24 hours ago um, and of course from the time I'm recording and um, everyone you know have to wish condolences to his family his friends and everyone else's football's really lost a gentleman football's lost a, a man of, of, of the game a person that helped transcend the game that helped transcend one of the biggest figures in the world in, in Pele who passed away of course just a little over a year ago and that legacy will remain intact in terms of what he was capable of doing throughout his illustrious footballing career so we lost the big one in Mario Lobo Zagallo guys make sure you're checking it out make sure you check out other videos make sure you because they're gonna be coming fast and furious that's for sure but uh, make sure you do so all right thank you so much ciao